We are live from Johannesburg in the next hour or so. Tito Mboweni will be live uh, from Cape Town. And from there, he will tell South Africa how he thinks the finances should look like in the next year or so. The question, of course, has got to be, will he be able to do enough to start off a downgrade by Moody's? Or will he be able to uh, help reduce the country's debt burden? And will South Africans get any tax breaks at all? Now, for some suggestions on how the finance minister uh, can achieve all three, in the studio with me, I am joined by Annabel Bishop. She's chief economist at Investec. Annabel, as always, thank you for coming in. Later on, we expect Tendani Machimuli to make it from across the road uh, to come in and talk about uh, uh, things that affect uh, the consumer. She is from uh, Liberty SA. And in the studio with us now is Carl Mandy, PwC tax policy leader and Saika National Tax Committee member. Thank you both for coming through today. But first, Boeing's budget is likely to offer many words of encouragement uh, to the entrepreneurs of the country, we hope, often seen as the salvation of the economy by the politicians. Let's put it this way, some politicians. Now, the words, I think, will be too late for South African businesses uh, that have already closed uh, doors this month after nearly half a century of sweat and tears, brotherly elbow grease. These are the furniture makers, Bacchus Brothers of Johannesburg. The confidence of South Africa is shattered. The Johannesburg home of Ryan Bacos is a monument to half a century of hard work by his family. All of this furniture was made and marketed by the hand of his uncles, who made Bacos Brothers a household name in Johannesburg, a name that has become as much a part of the past of the city as the skill that crafted this furniture. This chair is a Chippendale chair. It's an English design. It's about 600 years old. This chair is made in the Bacos factory. This particular chair is made out of oak. Um, it's stained in black. You can also get it in solid mahogany, solid walnut, as well as solid beech. Any solid wood that you would like, we could do it. This particular stain is black for oak. You could have it in, a fif in 50 different other colors of stain. It all began in 1971 when the Bacos brothers, who all worked in furniture stores, decided to set up their own. In the 1970s, industry and mining were booming in Johannesburg. The idea was to sell to the growing number of upwardly mobile middle class. It wasn't an easy job in the early days. It was tough. Uh, they had just started their business. Um, obviously, money was tight. Um, they were young and strong, healthy boys. They would sell the furniture during the day and at night take off their jackets and go and deliver furniture, carry couches up and down stairs. At the age of 19, Ryan Bacos joined the family firm right at the bottom. Sure, in the beginning, the uncles and my father put me everywhere in the business. I first started in the warehouse, working underneath Josiah Corza. Um, he had worked for the family for about 38 years. He passed away two weeks ago. Um, Josiah was my boss. I was learning how the paperwork would work. The paperwork would work. Um, they put me on the trucks. I was doing deliveries. The company prided itself in making 80% of all the furniture it sold. But along with cheap imported competition from China came harsh economic times and a day in politics that the company will never forget. Since 2008 till 2017, um, the business grew at 25% year on year. We had opened factories. Um, we bought um, a Gordon Fraser factory that was in liquidation. So, and the business's retail end was expanding at 25% year on year. Then in 2017, everything was going good. We had just signed a lease to open up our store in Cape Town, the first store in Cape Town for Bacchus Brothers. And we had planned the opening for the 7th of April, 2017. What happened in the beginning, on about the 2nd of April, that was when uh, President Zuma fired Provin Gordon. And that was when the, the people were striking on the streets, and they were striking on the 7th of April, the day that we were opening up our Cape Town showroom. I couldn't change the opening date because all of the media and marketing had been planned three weeks before that. The radio ads were recorded. The... the ads for the newspapers were designed, everything was pre-booked, so we had to go ahead. Everyone was picketing outside our store. Um, and that April, 
And needless to say that our sales for the opening were not great at all. Um, we did 400,000 Rand on the Friday in sales, where our first sale, the first day of our sales in Johannesburg, we would do 5 million Rand. We were expecting to do at least a million Rand on the first day. We did 400,000, and on the Saturday, we did absolutely zero in sales. Even political change didn't help. President Sir Ramaphosa, who was a customer of Bacos Brothers, cleaned up government tenders and tightened the purse strings. It didn't do much for the company. Our major market were the black diamonds. 95% of our business were black diamond business. Um, the, the tenderpreneurs who were getting lucrative government contracts, um, et cetera, et cetera, they were our clientele from around the country that fly in and buy from Bacchus Brothers. When the crisis and the, the, the switch in political powers and so on started happening, our sales just carried on plummeting. Our customers that were good customers for years, we would call them and see if they would come back into our stores. Nothing would happen. Our feed count went down. Our quotations went down. Our revenues went down. And no matter what we tried to do, we cut margins, we marketed, we ran sales, promotions, everything we tried to do, we couldn't revive the sales out of Backus Brothers. The last three years were the killer. In December, usually the busiest month of the year, sales dived into negative growth. Retail sales dived so badly that even the Bacos brothers, who had spent their life selling, couldn't work out why. We were shocked. We were talking to our salesmen around the country, saying, what's going on? Our sales were down 55% for the month of April. And that was the beginning of the deterioration of our retail sales. For Bacos Brothers, the revenue evaporated rapidly. In 2017, the year to the end of February, turnover was 158 million rand. By February this year, the turnover was a mere 55 million rand, now nearly two-thirds. Well, this building here in Dunkeld in Johannesburg was one of the many stores that the Bacos Brothers opened in the good times. It didn't last very long, and now it's been taken over by a well-known electronics company that appears to have survived the storm. The last two years of the Bacos Brothers proved very painful indeed. Every two to three months, there were retrenchments until all of the 288 employees had gone. So what now for Ryan Bacos and his family business ambitions? The second we see the, the, the market stabilised, the housing market stabilised, and there's room for high-end furniture, we will definitely reopen our brand. So these pieces of handcrafted furniture become a piece of history. Whatever the politicians promise in this year's budget, also into history will go the slice of entrepreneurial spirit that created this furniture. Chris Bishop, CNBC Africa, Johannesburg. Thank you, Chris. It's a story that's uh, symptomatic of what's happening in South Africa's business environment without a shred of doubt. And a lot of people will be looking to the finance minister today to see if he's got some good news about trying to help business uh, survive in this uh, economy. As I said, it's a big day for us here in uh, South Africa today. The finance minister, Tito Mbaweni, presenting uh, his budget, st budget statement shortly uh, in parliament. And uh, I think uh, there are some people who know the details uh, in our world, <coughs> excuse me, as reporters, is there's uh, what we call lockdown, of course. So they go in there at 6 a.m. They've been sitting there at 6 a.m. writing all the stories, the headlines, etc., etc. And the moment Tito Mboweni opens his mouth at 2 p.m., the headlines will run. And then we'll see the reaction of the markets and everybody else in the studio with me to talk about what to expect out of that budget. I'll introduce them again. My guest to my right uh, is uh, uh, Annabel Bishop. She's Chief Economist at Investec. Again, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you for coming through on my left. I have Tendani Machimuli. She's Customer Economist at Liberty SA. Thank you for coming through, ma'am. And uh, we also have in the studio with us today Carl Mandi, PW Tax Policy Leader at, and uh, a SICA National Tax Committee member. You've got big titles, Carl. <laughs> and I am going to start with you because I think we all know the picture that's going to emerge. A dire situation painted of the country's economy and a minister's bid to try to patch holes in that uh, dire picture. And we are all very scared. Is there going to be a value-added tax increase? 
I think the chance is certainly there. And it really all just depends on how he's going to try and close the gap in the, in the fiscal deficit. I mean, if you're looking at 60 odd billion rands worth of measures that need to be taken, and bearing in mind there's already 10 billion rand penciled in for taxes from last year's budget already. Um, if he's looking for an additional 50 billion rand and he can't get that from the expenditure side, then he has to look to, to taxes to, to, to close that gap. Um, and if he's looking for anything more than a 20 billion rand, then that is probably where he's going to have to go because he's not going to raise that from, from personal income tax. He's not going to raise it from corporate income tax. And he's not going to raise it from the, from the plethora of other smaller taxes as well. What is your worst case scenario? Our worst... <laughs> I don't know if we want to go there, but I mean, our worst case scenario is he's unable to cut expenditure to any, any significant extent and he's going to try and raise it all with taxes. Um, I don't think that's a likely scenario. Um, What's the best case? Best case, um, uh, only the 10 billion rand worth of tax increases and, and the rest he gets with uh, expenditure cuts and primarily on the public sector wage bill. But what are the chances of that happening? I'm mm -hmm. not so sure. Tendani, you nodded. Yeah, I agree. I'm with uh, Chris here because, uh, Kyle, sorry, I'm with Kyle on this one because I think the gap must have widened more than the 52 billion they talk about in the medium term budget statement. I, that's, my, that's my view. And she keeps a tab on the numbers on the monthly basis. <laughs> yes, she does. Um, yeah, <coughs> and she's agreeing with me. So I think it would, it, it, would, it would have widened further, and there is no way that is going to get that from uh, personal income tax and corporate tax. And my view is also that uh, to get that much from mm. cutting down on the public sector wage bill uh, is unlikely. You've heard what the union said yesterday. And I think um, there are partners in the alliance, so yeah. I'm not sure that uh, he's going to have the wherewithal. So what are you expecting? Where is he going to find the money? I think if they, he doesn't find it, it anywhere else, I think that they will have to bite the bullet and Which go with uh, a increase. VAT increase. What I don't know whether that is unlikely. I mean, 16 percent. I don't know if that's likely. That's if one also there's political will, because remember the economy is extremely weak. Yeah. You're not mm -hmm. seeing anything coming from the demand side. So for to yeah. push consumers <coughs> even further, mm -hmm. that's that's a big risk. Absolutely, mm -hmm. Annabelle. I made you listen to all of this. You're the macroeconomist. Mm -hmm. First, the investor view on where he's going to find that six billion or 59 billion or whatever billion uh, hole that needs to be fixed? Look, I think there will be an effort to cut expenditure, whether, it's, uh, whether it's just here or there, and maybe not even that much, but I think there is going to be an effort, you know, because we finally come to the point where our tax buoyancy ratios are essentially flat, what you is know, that? and that's really just saying that if you continue to eat increase tax, you think you're going to get more money, you're going to continue to increase your tax revenue, yeah. but at some point you actually get less, and that's when your tax buoyancy ratio starts to collapse. And what that basically means is you've overtaxed people. Right. So we have got How in South Africa, we well, the projections so show it's fairly flat, but the projections don't factor in the fact that economic growth is likely to be weaker this year than it was when those projections previously were made. Yeah. And of course, what this is really talking about is the consumer is battling to stomach the tax increases we've had. You know, w w what many forget is over the past 10 years, so really the past decade, 2010 to 2019, we've already seen huge tax increases. We've seen a massive run-up in taxation. It's been one of the reasons mm. why economic growth has slowed so much. It slowed yeah. from above 3.3% yeah. to likely last year, probably around 0.4%. <coughs> if we hit the economy with another massive round of tax increases this year, mm. and particularly if we really focus on that big um, opportunity to raise tax, you know, your, your middle to lower income area where most of your taxpayers sit, yeah. and of course where the VAT increase would be levied at, you run the risk of actually seeing economic growth recording less yeah. than 0.4% this yeah. year. Remember yeah. we have to contend with load shedding as well, and of yeah. course the impact globally from the coronavirus. Other countries around the world will be giving fiscal stimulus, yeah. and so they'll actually be giving monetary stimulus. So it's going to be very hard to put that through. You are suggesting that uh, he will cut expenditure. Tell me, where will he cut? Because so, so Kosati the is saying if he does touch uh, civil servant salaries, quote, there will be war. So basically there's two things that are going on. It's not necessarily cutting salaries. It's not giving them salary and wage increases that are above CPI inflation. That's where the misunderstandings come. So no one's looking to reduce their salaries each month. They'll still get the same amount they were getting, or they'll get more. And in fact, they probably will get slightly more. They'll yeah. get what inflation is. Right. But to give them more than inflation, and that's the big reason why there's been this run-up in expenditure yeah. over the last few years that's been attributed 
to civil servants, which has damaged you know, the, the fiscal health, yeah. that's been attributed to giving them increases above CPI inflation. CPI inflation is what now? Four, four and a half percent? Yep. Everyone gets a CPI inflation increase if they're lucky in the private sector. The private sector is actually seeing people not getting salary and wage increases at all. Yeah. And in fact, actually s seeing some salaries cut just so people can hang on to their jobs. You yeah. saw what happened in the snippet earlier with Backus Brothers and how companies are really suffering. Yeah. So that is what they'll be looking at, not yeah. to increase <coughs> above inflation. The budget, of course, is a complex document taking into account many considerations, political positions, social, societal positions. But if we reduce it to our households, which I think in the end is what it is, how come the person who is in charge of this household is unable to cut when he needs to cut? And I'm saying he because we know it's a he. I'll start with you. Well, I think as a, you, you touched on it because there are political considerations that come into the equation as well. So ideally, if we were running our own households, we wouldn't be spending more than what we're bringing in. Um, and preferably, we would be even saving some of what we wouldn't even be spending everything that we, that we earn. Are we saying this guy has got uh, very naughty children who are threatening him if he does anything to touch their current living standards? Well, I, I think this is... And he's scared of his children. Well, I think that's part of the problem, uh, absolutely. And, and the trade unions are a big part of that problem in terms of the hold they have over government to be able to, to do what needs to be done. And what government really knows needs to be done, but they don't have uh, the political capital, if you like, to do so. Um, but that, that is the overriding problem, is that ultimately a, a budget is a political issue. It is. Tendani, what is it that the ANC is waiting for here? a complete economic collapse before it begins to cut and we talk austerity and go beyond talking uh, austerity and actually, actually cut expenditure and say to civil servants, you cannot have a bonus if your economy is not performing, mm -hmm. like the Zimbabweans. Mm -hmm. so, so my view is that part of the problem we have is, I think during uh, President Mandela and Beki's time, government policy was with government. However, now you see that it seems to have shifted. The NEC has an overall say of what yeah. government policy is. Yeah. You might recall a tweet by the minister a few weeks back to say, you send somebody to go and do a job, yeah. but then you tell him yeah. what to do when he's saying, this is where we need to go. Yeah. Um, no, no, we, you can't go there because of other considerations, other than economic considerations. Yeah. I'm not sure whether we're really aware of um, or I mean, the ANC is really aware of the difference yeah. between South Africa Incorporated yeah. and the ANC. Yeah. And when Until you say- it loses yes, power. Yes, and, and uh, you, you said that are they waiting for the country to collapse oh. uh, until they before they do anything. Yeah. I want to suggest that the majority of those who are saying yeah. we should do this or we, should do, we shouldn't do that yeah. are not even aware of what the minister is warning about, about what happens yeah. when a country collapses Absolutely. completely. Guys, we're going to be here for the next to what, uh, 40 minutes or so, so I need to get you cappuccinos. So yes. in the meantime, let's take a look at how the markets are trading ahead of that big uh, budget statement. Before we went into this discussion, the RAND, I can tell you, was definitely weaker by more than 1%. On the JSC, there was also blood all over the floor. Of course, the coronavirus business is all over uh, town, as you can see from uh, that JSC picture. We're talking how many points? 645. Saso, I remind you, was down more than 5%.
All right, now our coffees are here. We are getting back into the business of trying to understand what the minister is about uh, to present. Uh, Annabel, you wanted to contribute to the debate be just before we went about this uh, unruly household that uh, the father appears unable to control. Look, I think, you know, one of the reasons we've seen the run-up in expenditure in South Africa, besides the above inflation increases for salary and wages in South Africa, there's also been a sharp rise in interest payments on debt. Right. And, of course, debt has risen dramatically in South Africa. You know, it's, it's, it's really risen over the last 10 years from below 30% to what was previously expected to peak at 60%. Now, of course, the so scare stories... it's more than doubled in the last well, five years. Yeah, and, and you know, now it's already at 60. And, of course, you know, the scare stories are, does it take it to 80, like yeah. the MTBPS? And How the likely is that? Well, before we talk about that, the thing about taxation is if you increase VAT and if you increase the top-tier marginal tax rate and yeah. you don't adjust for fiscal drag and you do what else you need to has been suggested. Just explain slightly fiscal drag the Fiscal drag like basically me means that understand. every year that inflation goes up, if you don't raise the tax brackets, you you're taxing someone 45% on you know a certain amount. Yeah. And if you don't adjust those tax brackets, eventually inflation devalues their money, so okay. they're just paying more they're and more. But less, yeah. the point really is the civil servants who benefit from above inflation increases lose out from higher VAT increases right. and from income tax because increases because they, are they pay for it. Pay home is, uh, yes. yeah, so, so why increase? taxation to pay people more money when they're going to be losing part of that money anyway through higher taxes. You know what I'm trying to say? So that's that issue as well that actually needs to have a more rational situation. We sure. can't see our debt to GDP ratio rising to 81%. Yeah, I want us to talk about that one mm -hmm. because uh, the numbers, if I may remind you again very quickly what the minister promised. This is, I think, in the medium-term budget policy statement uh, in October. Mm -hmm. He said we are looking at what? Uh, I am looking at the numbers here. The main budget deficit was seen at 6.2% of GDP mm -hmm. for this year and was expected to widen a year later to 6.8 and the year after to 6.2. So a bump and then another bump and then a slight okay. drop. That's not Outcome. But that's Let's not get the numbers from you guys. Mm. What that's are you expecting? Well, that's not what the rating agencies are looking at. They're looking at the debt. They're not looking at the fiscal deficit. But we've it? got it at 6.1%, mm. but they're actually looking at debt. They have to assess us on the basis of our credit worthiness, our ability yeah. to repay debt. Yeah. And we've increased that from 60% as a peak in yeah. uh, last year this time yeah. to in the mini budget we said it's actually going to peak at 81%. And that's the big issue. The fiscal deficit you mentioned is just a byproduct of the debt. Right. In a smaller term picture. Quickly, what are you expecting? Um, I'm expecting that we're going to see the, the, the ratio going up because I don't see how uh, revenue would have grown. I don't see how the economy is going to support that. So the rating agency are going to be looking at what is the government going to do first to uh, sustainably cut down expenditure. Secondly, yeah. how are we going to service the debt that we already have? I mean, as Annabelle mentioned, interest payment have become the most Actually, expensive Actually, we've got a graph that debt. needs to be showing yeah. right now because that graph shows precisely what you are talking about. Mm. The single biggest uh, rising item on that budget it's is... the interest payments on the debt. So mm. so that's, that, that's what's worrying and I think that's what the rating agents are going to look at. How are you going to service the debt and, and, and how are you going to contain it, i.e. not go to... 80.1% or above. I mean, that, that, that can happen. It's, it's, the, yeah. it's, a ni it's not worst yeah. case, it's a nightmare. Just scenario. for the record, what's your GDP, uh, what's your deficit number? <coughs> um, we, we said we're going to look at, you mean the, the debt to GDP, I think it's going to no, go No, no, not debt to GDP, just the GDP, um, sorry, the deficit number for uh, 2019, um, the budget deficit. She's got 6.1 percent. I've got 6.3 percent. 6.3 percent. Uh, where are you, Paul? Uh, PWC, we are at 6.4 percent. 6.4 percent. You are alarmist. You must be <laughs> 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 dealt with, as uh, some politicians will say. <laughs> we must be dealt with. <laughs> well, you know what? Those, those politicians yes. will talk like that. Let's talk about that debt. And let's talk about the measures. And I'm hoping we can still show that paragraph. I did ask uh, that uh, we uh, make a graphic out of uh, this uh, uh, line item by line item increase that shows interest payments as the highest uh, uh, rising uh, cost inside the, uh, that budget. Let's just talk about uh, that budget debt, no, not the budget deficit, but the, de the debt to GDP ratio and the projections that you guys are looking at. Yeah, so, so I mean, uh, it's. Worth she spoke of 80%. Yeah, so it's worth putting uh, what, what the minister seemingly did in, in the mini-budget into perspective and so on. Mm. And he seems to have now developed this habit of using the mini-budget as a shock tactic mm. um, to try and get what he wants or what he needs to get in, in the February budget. Um, 
So I think what he was presenting there was his worst case scenario. And it was the case of, well, if we did nothing, yeah. this is where we were going to land up. Right. Um, I don't think that's the intention. Mm. I think the intention is to do something and to do as much as possible that yeah. they can do and as early as possible. Mm. Um, so that's what the reason why I say I think you are looking at them doing something in the region of, uh, of, of 50 to 60 billion rand additional over what was it indicated in the, in the mini budget. Um, it's a question of what that's going to look like. Mm. It's going to do, but I, th I think they will. Th they have to do something. Otherwise, we yeah, a downgrade is a given. Yeah. So I was making the point earlier that uh, this is Tito Mboweni is, is the third budget or second? Mm. I think it's third budget. If we include the mini budget yeah. uh, that he started oh. out with, right? Which wasn't his own inheriting it and coming in uh, when something had already been prepared. But he's been around with us. I think that's the point that I want to make here for a while. And uh, he has promised, when I look back on what he promised in each of those budget statements, I do not recall any time he has been able to hit target or below target. Now, the point I'm making is that if he is unable to get the ANC and those that determine uh, the parameters around spending to fall in line, why is he keeping on presenting it? Is it time for Tito to walk? Please don't say that. I know you keep <laughs> saying that to me <laughs> every time on the show, really. <laughs> Look, I think you need some good men. You yeah. need some people who we can hold the line. He was the good man who would be able to knock some sense into uh, his colleagues. I think he's trying. And, and you know, he's failing. Well, I think he's outlay, you know, I really outlined in the mini budget last year what will happen if we don't succeed. And if we don't succeed, we get a credit rating downgrade. There's the misunderstanding that that doesn't really matter. You know what, we get a bit of uh, impact to the market and then things are all rosy again. That's not what happens. You know, if we're showing a debt trajectory of above 80%, and this is what we're talking about, such a very high debt trajectory, if we're showing that, then we're not going to get one downgrade, we're going to get more downgrades. Mm -hmm. And already the risk is that Fitch and Standard & Poor's, who are equally as important as Moody's from that perspective, perspective are already downgrading us through the ranks. And if that increases costs. And we Those costs that we're looking at uh, on screen, the debt service costs. But mm. also it increases volatility in the markets mm. and also it makes it more likely that you can move from the B grade to the C grade, which is just before D, which is default. Zambia is now on 6C plus, I think. C C plus and you don't want to like go that. there because yeah. that means eventually we can have a bankrupt straight and that's when the IMF sets, steps in with a bailout uh -huh. and you're then under its mandate. So, you know, to answer your question really, you know, is he actually doing the right thing? I think he yeah. is. He's, he's portraying it. And, um, my view on the debt is that we're probably going to see a lower projection in this budget, yeah. and they're probably going to budget for lower salary and wage increases. And that's if, as you said, he, he, he tries to get everyone to toe the line. Yeah. And of course, then we're going to see some civil action later in the year, strike action. Yeah. But that is probably what needs to happen. Yeah. Absent that, we there might as well... There needs to be a fine. There needs to be blood. Someone needs to get bruised, and then they lose, mm -hmm. and we get on to do what we need to do. Mm -hmm. I still want your thoughts as well on Tito Mboweni, whether he's the right man given he what he has uh, achieved or what he hasn't been able to achieve. We'll start with you, we come to you. I don't think there's anybody now that I can think of who has the guts to tell, his et as to tell it as it is like he does. He might not always win the fight, but he doesn't back off. So you don't want a minister who really literally takes a brief and not think things through from the NEC. He does, he's doing the right things, he's tried uh, some things, and I think there are some things that are going to come through that uh, move us forward. I don't think there's anybody other than him who can do what he needs to do and tell us that it is, uh, tell it as it is, yeah. with the ANC, NEC. Can I remind you that we used to say that about Pravin Godan? Uh, yes, but I, I still back Bowen. Okay. And I agree with that, hundred percent. Is on with mm. that, that he is the man. And did you speak to each other before you? No, came? we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, we did not. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> but, but I mean, picking up on your preventing, he was the one who backed down when it came to Eskom when Eskom yeah. was saying no increases and so on. So, well, thankfully, he's he's no longer the minister of finance. If that was going to be his approach, yeah. Um, because the 2018 um, wage settlement agreement that was entered into yeah. did us no favours whatsoever because that's exactly what happened. Government rolled sure. over yeah. shortly before the elections again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so no, Tito uh, is still the guy. Tito, Tito's the guy and as I say, he, he, he calls it as it is yeah. and, uh, and he doesn't change his, uh, his views just to, to suit the occasion. But Tito of course answers to another guy whose name is Cyril Ramaphosa and uh, I've always made the point that uh, Cyril needs to win the political battle for him to be able to enforce uh, the discipline, fiscal discipline that's required here. Is this also a failing of Cyril? Start, start, and we'll come <laughs> to you. And then we're going to listen to, uh, to, 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 to uh, the thoughts of uh, business leadership essay. Well, 
I think Cyril's fast approaching the, the, the point where he needs to put his foot down and right. say, or he I'm, loses the man, I'm in charge, yeah. and, and this is how it is and so on. Um, you get the sense that uh, he's been using Tito as his hitman, if you like. Um, um, but this is the Tough point now where he has. Is. Yeah. Yeah. And but now he needs to actually step up and, and support Tito and, 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 and get the rest of his cabinet on sides. Absolutely. I, I asked earlier in another program whether Tito has a knife at all. I don't know what you think, but yeah, I want you to answer that and then answer the the the, 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 uh, the president's question. You mean a knife that he brings to a gunfight? No. To cut to cut the but the, 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 he does. I think he's got a, 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 he's got a small knife. sharpened sword. He, he's uh, got a sword? Uh, he has to have one. I mean, if we have to take this economy forward, I mean, yeah. I, 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 I'm agreeing with Annabelle's uh, statement earlier that you need to cut expenditure and cut it sustainably to appease the, the, the rating agencies. Otherwise, this is not going to fly. Mm. As for Cyril supporting Boeing, yes, mm. I, I do have a feeling he sometimes that he, he Moeni is the front is man using and, and whatever. In a good way. We don't mean this in any disparaging manner. No, no, no. In, yeah. a, in a good way. And But I think also he needs to be seen to be leading. I don't know if he's going to become any more popular in the ANC if he's not already by kowtowing yeah. to what they have to say and, and not getting through the policies, the very good policies that mm -hmm. he has. He keeps on talking about having attracted um, pledges to mm. invest in yeah, South Africa. But the money is not and coming. you turn around mm. and, yeah, you would like to see some electricity for eight hours, mm -hmm. at Thank least you. of a working day for you to Thank come you. in and, 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 and set up a manufacturing concern yeah, in yeah. South Africa. Even the, the guys that are already in here, they're they are, they are, they are, they are losing money every day, the manufacturing sure. sectors that are here from outside South Africa. So, mm. so he, he needs to be seen to be doing something. He might be, but I think yeah. there isn't time for, for, for hope. For sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Buttering rum with a small knife. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so many anonymous to war. <laughs> <laughs> it's a war situation, right? It's a crisis. Look, I think certainly that um, Tito Mbaweni is a man we've all pinned our hopes on, and it's being seen very much as a make or break budget. Mm -hmm. And the thing about Moody's is Moody's wants to now see if this budget actually talks to shows and actually tables, it plans, it yeah. the, the projections and expenditure and revenue and all the other line items, if that actually reflects what was suggested at the mm -hmm. MTBPS. The MTBPS was a shocking budget, yeah. put us on a negative outlook, which means we absolutely will get a downgrade, yeah. unless we return to a stable outlook. Yeah. This yeah. is now the opportunity to put us on a stable Stable footing, yeah. and that's why I think the the well, I think the debt debt projections will be lower yeah. than you know that eighty percent peak. I think it's probably going to be maybe you know significantly closer to seventy percent. Okay. And I think as well there's going to be expenditure cuts. We talked to you, but yes, I think that Soromaposa has full face in Tito and Boeni, yeah. and I think that they are probably going to push quite hard now in this budget to actually achieve what they want to do. Yeah. And I think that we are going to see discomfort because I think it's going to be broad based you know yeah. in the state of the nation address so I'm opposed said we need to get the salary and wage increase situation under control yeah. so I think that Tito probably will actually address that yeah. if he doesn't then yeah. I would imagine there's been some political interference because yeah. that is exactly what he showed needs to happen at the last and that he is losing that political interference or fight I will change that interference to fight we are sitting I think this is what you guys are saying we are sitting in the last chance saloon mm -hmm. it needs to be a very uncomfortable place how uncomfortable will Tito make it? Well, let's listen to the view of our business leadership, South Africa, which represents more than a hundred of the country's biggest corporates. Our reporter, Karabli Tlatla, spoke to the CEO, Busisiwe Mavuso. You know, Tito gets it. You know, Tito understands what's at stake. He understands, you know, he understands the, the difficult situation that we find ourselves and the need to act with a degree of agency, you know, when it comes to these issues. But I think, actually not, I think Tito is actually constrained by Lutuli House in terms of how he can move, you know, and what allocations need to be made, how, you but know? But he has a boss I in government. Like, right. Surely his boss must support him. And I think probably maybe this is a function of the political system, Karabo, to say that I don't understand why the government needs to defer their decision making to Lutuli House. Yes, they are an ANC led government, you know, but the hat they wear, you know, in Parliament, you know, as government officials, is a different hat that they wear, you know, when they are comrades. And they know, must run Lutuli an agenda House. of government right? and, and its actions. Actually 
run an agenda of government mm -hmm. because then when they're in government, they are representing 59 million South Africans. You know, mm -hmm. they are not representing... Those who voted for right, the Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. They are not representing NC members. And I think this is where things therefore get muddied and they get lost. Mm -hmm. You know, to say that, you know, the actions that we need to take as a country, you know, it's the same thing. SOE boards and SOE CEOs mm. need to be signed off mm. by an ANC NEC, mm. you know, or NGC or whatever. In my mind, it, it doesn't make sense. Why? It doesn't right? Make because they, 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 you, 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 you've got a, a minister of public enterprises, and you would think that, in as far as the shareholder is concerned, you know, that is where the buck stops. But mm -hmm. we know that it doesn't stop there. You know, it still actually goes down to the politicians. And I think this is where the problem, maybe, with mm. our political system is. But I therefore say, you know, is the uh, I still find fault with those that are sitting as government officials mm. to say that they need to actually be decisive, you know, in their actions. Mm. You know, because when they take the oath of office, you know, they promise to actually serve South Africa Inc., you know, not mm. the ANC. You know, and I think that is where it, it therefore gets problematic. Is it a foregone conclusion that Moody's will downgrade us? And how are your members preparing for that eventuality? You know, whether or not Moody's downgrade, I don't know if it's a foregone conclusion. You know, I'd like to think that it is, you know, but you probably speak to people in certain corners and they say it's not. But I think irrespective of how Moody's um, decides on the 27th of March, Karabo, our country is in a crisis, oh. right? When you look at the all, in, all the indicators that we normally measure, you know, from a well-being perspective, from an uh, a, a, a economic perspective, you know, the, the indicators are all going south. Mm -hmm. You know, our people are yearning for change in this country. You know, we need to start doing more to mm -hmm. change the economic situation in this country. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Moody's saying that we are keeping your rating at the negative outlook or we are even reviewing it back to stable or whatever, it doesn't change how our people are feeling on the ground. Mm. The Section 189s from companies are coming in thick and fast. These issues that you and I have been mm. speaking about for mm. the past 20 minutes, it's issues that are actually affecting and impacting the lives of South Africans on the ground. So we should not actually be holding off and be looking at what Moody's is going to say. We should actually be saying, as a government, we need to be doing better. We, know our we need problems. to be more decisive. Mm -hmm. And we just need to move and act. We don't seem to be showing the dexterity we need to, to revive the economy. Yeah. So the finance minister has been one of one in his Twitter <laughs> corner saying, hey, why don't we find a way to liberalize our view on, on cannabis industry, for instance? You know, I don't know. I've got no views on that. But I will tell you what would actually assist. You know, one of the biggest problems that we're sitting, in, uh, we're sitting on as a country is the escalating public uh, sector wage bill, mm. you know? And I would think that if Kosadu wanted to be helpful, they'd probably be saying we are not going to demand any salary increase for employees in the public sector for the next three years. Let's contain <coughs> that spending at exactly where it is for the next three years. It doesn't help for them to continue to demand eight and seven percent increases in an economy that has not grown by two percent. And inflation is four and a half. And inflation, private sector, you know, is giving four and a half salary increases. I don't know where therefore should government get 8% salary increases? It is, it is ludicrous, it is, it, is, it is crazy. And I think those are the tangible actions that we can actually implement to try and salvage the situation. Okay, so uh, that was Busiswe uh, Mavuso, uh, the CEO of our Business Leadership South Africa with their views uh, on what the budget uh, should contain. So we continue our discussion here on uh, what's going likely to be presented by the minister in how many minutes? In about 17 uh, minutes uh, from uh, now. Uh, quickly, if I can just remind you where the markets are trading at the moment, we've got uh, the all share index down more than 1%, top 40 also down more than 1%, uh, dollar rand is weaker, we're sitting at 15 uh, 26 uh, to uh, the dollar. A lot of that, those losses, of course, because of these fears around the spread of the coronavirus around the world. The World Health Organization warning, we're not too far off uh, from uh, describing this thing as a pandemic. So, 
it is a serious crisis. But within that crisis, we've got also uh, a financial crisis here in South Africa because government finances are totally not okay. And we're talking about that. Reminding you again in the studio with me, I have Annabel Bishop, she's from Investec, and Danny Machmuli uh, from uh, Liberty, and Kyle Mandy uh, from PwC Tax Policy. Thank you. Uh, okay, guys, we have avoided, we say elephant in the room, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the largest mammal in the world is a whale, isn't it? <laughs> right? I think that's what we have. Okay, so let's it's tackle. <laughs> let's tackle water. it. Let's <laughs> tackle it. So, what will he say? I want to begin with what you expect him to say, rather than what you want him to say. Mm. Let's start with you. Look, I think certainly the big crunch is the SAEs. SAA needing bailouts very, very imminently, and of course um, ESCOM as well. And essentially, they are on government's balance sheet. So the debt of of the um, standard entities that are guaranteed by government here, we talk about SAA and ESCOM, they actually are now part of government's debt from the point of view that government is now actually having to make their payments. Right. You know, government's having to put the money in. And of course, you know, what, what we have heard before is that they're not going to put them on the balance sheet. I don't see any other option. You know, certainly given that the PIC Casati deal where they suggested they might assist That's what you think down. he should do, but what do you think he will do? Probably will have to do that. I, I Some more money. If will he take them, do you think? Well, look, first, first of all, they need to put them on the, on the balance sheet. Then they need to amalgamate it to the rest of the debt. And then they need to roll it forwards. If they just continue to give little injections all the time and not actually own yeah. the fact that they now, you know, the, 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 the guaranteed debt is actually yeah. their own debt, we're going to continue to find but ourselves... But are you saying he will do it in this budget? He should. I don't know if he will. He should. Okay. Um, I think um, my view is that uh, as far as what he should say, I expect him to give more clarity on how he's going to repurpose uh, spending from consumption to investment okay. uh, so that we can pick up on the infrastructure. I also expect him to almost have a surgeon's knife to cut incisively in terms of... Are you of giving him a knife now? You said he needed no, no, a sword. surgeon's <laughs> scalpel, sorry. Ah. Scalpel. Ooh, it's <laughs> getting sharper. It's getting sharper. In terms of the SOE debt, um, I mean... We know that uh, SAA, uh, the, the, the money advanced by the Development Bank is going to run out per the minister uh, by the end of March in terms of... So he needs to say something today? He needs to say something about how that is going to continue. What is he going to say? Um, he's going to announce some more... Remember, the business rescue plan has already been criticized by some in the alliance. Yeah. The minister probably would have announced that this is it with SAA, mm -hmm. but I don't think he's got the mandate to say that. Okay, so uh, he's going to announce more money for SAA. He is going to announce more money for SAA, but also to also, I think, move the debt where they can uh, sustainably manage it. The other thing that I expect him to say as well is give um, some impetus what the president already said about uh, whether we're going to get electricity generated from sources other than ESCOM, which is, I think, is going to give some confidence to businesses if they can start generating their own power. Mm. Uh, that is going to go some way into a uh, continuance of business activity in the yeah. country, and that is going to contribute to where we need to be. Because I, I, if he doesn't say much about SOEs yeah. and how we're going to remedy that, that will be a problem. Yeah, I'm going to come back to you and ask what you think about Annabel's suggestion that perhaps we might hear him say, South African Airways, Denel, ESCOM, mm. uh, cease and exist. Their debt is on the South African government books. Well, but they still exist, just their debt They, they all guaranteed. exist, but the debt is going to move on to the government. Sorry. Yes. Don't get too far ahead. <laughs> 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 yeah, so in terms of the SAEs, um, I, I don't think you're going to see anything too unexpected there and so on. I think you're going to see the, the, the same noises being made around the ESCOM and the possible still restructuring, which might be a little bit watered down from what was previously indicated. Again, um, you're still going to see the money being pumped into ESCOM. Um, in, in terms of the support. Um, I agree that you, you're going to see further money being pumped into How SAA. Much? How much? Oh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I think it's largely going to, it's essentially their operating deficit that's going to be people put on there on, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I would imagine they're going to have penciled that in, but until we know what the, the business rescue plan looks like, yeah. um, which ideally should have been finalised ahead of this budget, yeah. um, I, I don't think anyone knows. Um, and I think there's still a fight to be had there, both from a political perspective and, yeah. with, the, and with the unions. Mm -hmm in terms of what's going to happen with SAA. Yeah. Um, but I think you, you're you going to see further support being put into SAA. Yeah, um, the, yeah I, I think those are the obviously the main SAEs and so yeah. on. Um, 
what we haven't spoken about is, is the, let's call them the new SAEs that are, have now been announced in terms of the, the Sovereign state Wealth state Fund and the State Bank. Yeah, um, and where the money is going to come from. Mm. And, and the NHI by 2026. Yeah. 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 Yes. A lot, the long time coming one, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and how those, going, how those so are going to be funded. And yeah, and, and certainly looking at the, <laughs> at the reaction of Tita when, when, when that was announced in the SONA, yeah. um, uh, you, you get the strong sense he's not in favour of them. So it would be interesting to see what he has to say yeah. about how those things are going to be funded and how they're going to be structured. Mm. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know where they're going to find money to put into a sovereign wealth fund. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe it's going to be a tax that's going to be announced mm. from which then maybe money will be uh, well, funded. Well, hopefully not because no, no <laughs> sovereign wealth fund is funded out of taxes. Mm. Um, so that, that would be extraordinary if that's what mm. they're, they're, they're yeah. suggesting should yeah. happen. Yeah. Um, but uh, the priority should be to deal what with the deficit. So let's shift the, the question now, Paul, if I can start with you, to what should he say about the parastatals? Mm. Ideally, um, no more support for them. Let them, let them stand or fall based on, on their business case and whether or not they're able to, to operate in the market according to market principles. Mm. That should be the bottom line. Um, and that goes for SAA in particular. It goes to, for ESCOM as well, but mm. to, to maybe a slightly lesser extent because it is a strategic asset as well. Yeah, you um, recognize that. But, but yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, you know, I I ESCOM is the economy in, a, in, a, in, a, in many senses and so on. ESCOM can't so it fail. To be saved, it yeah. has to be saved. Uh, otherwise, we don't have an economy left. Would you, would you try to resuscitate SAA? No. You'd let it go? I'd let it go. Okay. Tindani? Same. Uh, you just have to get partners, some, some airline to buy it, and it's off of South Africans. So, so, so something interesting about SAA in terms of the alliance being pro-poor. I think it's exactly. the minister who said that you are actually subsidizing uh, people who are middle class I've been and saying higher it as well. mm, to fly mm. at the expense of those very same people. Well, they'll argue that is the, the 10,000 jobs that they are worried about. Yeah, but 10,000 jobs as as a percentage of 40... 9 million uh, without Maybe work. not 9 million poor, but maybe about 40 million South Africans who are just at the margin or yeah. below yeah. the average. Uh, is, is that something that is sustainable? I don't know if they think of it that way because these people are pro poor, they want to uplift the whole of South Africa, but they're mm. fighting for this flying yeah. public, which yeah. is really not a substantial we, part we, we of that. No, not so the poor. Not the poor. So, so I think SAA, sh uh, SAA can be bought by somebody else. What I don't know what do they with tried. ESCOM? ESCOM <laughs> has to. We, we don't have an option outside of ESCOM, so it's not as if you could fly another airline as you would Would you be in favor of privatizing it? I am in favor of what the minister has proposed and the, and, and the Which president. Which is eating a part of ESCOM's lunch. So, so just, yeah, eating a part of ESCOM's lunch, but also just uh, the, they didn't call it unbundling, I think, because the, the word was unbundling. Yes, it's, yeah, divisionalization is what because the president said. The, because for the African National Congress, ideology is still an important thing. We can't be talking privatization. We can't be talking about restructuring because yeah, then it comes across like we are leaning too far to the right and we are giving in to the capitalists, right? Yes, but, but the thing That's is, still uh, nobody has talked about uh, privatization yet. So I think just to when we see should be talking about what, privatization. what distribution does and whether distribution is healthy, or transmission is healthy, and then you can look at whether you, you privatize one of the subdivisions. Yep. That would be a step in the right dire direction, in my view. Mm -hmm. And the SOEs, yep. um, they should be run like businesses. Yeah, we're dreaming, of course. We're mm -hmm. dreaming, of yes. course. Annabelle? Well, you know, I disagree. I don't think ESCOM is the be all, end all, everything. I think, you know, if we have a look, we've got a lot of independent private power producers in the renewable energy section. You know, 5,000 megawatts are literally poised to come in immediately, start, you know, building and putting that onto the grid. And of course, you know, we've got the capacity to do that. We were obviously doing it before. And the strong renewable energy um, investment from the private sector, as well as obviously after 2030, we could get up to 30,000 megawatts. What's yeah. actually holding us back is legislation. Right. And, you know, the problem there is that, you know, we are already seeing the... Um, 
president, the finance minister, other people speaking on it, they're dipping the toe in the water. They're saying that, you know, self-supply, self electricity generation, SSEG, people who generate extra electricity, yeah. whether it's large in the agricultural, mining or industrial sector or small in the household, mm -hmm. they can now put onto the grid. They're starting to try and condition South drip, Africa to get drip, used drip, to, drip, yeah, drip. get used to private sector provision of electricity. Yeah. In other words, we need to move away from the fact that ESCOM is a be all and end all of everything. Yeah. And we actually move very strongly into private sector provision of electricity independent producers as well. The big question is how then do you pay off Eskom's debt? Because the question is, if Eskom is not producing, then yeah. it's going to battle to pay off its debt. Yeah. It's not going to pay off its debt anyway. 100%. It's not going to be able to produce enough to pay off its debt. There has yeah. to be a debt rescue anyway for Eskom. Tito so we then. need to... Sorry, Tito is there. Tito okay, is there. Great. He's making his way. Yeah, so, okay, so he hasn't been in any, any accident. He's making his way uh, <laughs> into Parliament. Where's the suitcase? Where's the suitcase? I hope someone is carrying that suitcase with that budget statement. Uh, <laughs> I hope they're going to see that at some point. <laughs> All right, finish your thought because... I need the final numbers from you guys in terms of uh, the big macro uh, expectations. Yeah, so I've divided into two issues. Yeah. One is the production of electricity in our economy, which we need for economic growth, and the other one is the debt issue at ESCO. Divided into two issues. Work on increasing the capacity of supply of electricity in South Africa from the private sector, yeah. from government and private sector partnerships, yeah. PPPs, and of course, you know, bringing ESCOM along as well to make use of the facilities it has. The big issue is the power stations, the coal-fired power stations, the majority of them are aging and are mm. going to fall over. Yes, we've got the new ones, Madupi and Kasili, yeah. very expensive, not properly finished, yeah. and of course, not producing as they should. Okay. So that is our big concern, divided into two issues. Okay, very quickly, let's do the budget statement. The budget deficit, you told me, is 6.1 percent. Uh, Moody's uh, March 27. Well, we are hoping the budget will be good enough today to avoid a credit rating downgrade in March, or at least be good enough to give the agency enough to think of to consider perhaps we may only see the downgrade in the first of November, because that negative outlook gives us 18 months. Yeah. So we could still wait until towards the end of this year for a final decision. What is going decision. to be his growth forecast for for for, for this budget? GDP growth. Yes. Uh, I think it's probably going to be 0.7. 0.7, that's what you're expecting tonight? Um, my expectation, I've given you what... Those three things, please. Yes, yeah. three things we said, 6.3%. Budget deficit, 6.3%. Yes, yeah. and uh, the other one was what? what? Uh, the uh, What's going to happen March 27, mm -hmm. and then um, the growth number that you're expecting to announce. I'm saying that if the government, I mean, if the minister announces measure to s reduce the debt, overall debt, is going to bode well for us and not be downgraded on the 27th of March. So a lot for me is hanging on the number and how it's going to fund that. And the last one was? Uh, the uh, growth expectations for this budget? Uh, for, for, 2019? for 2020. 2020, sorry, yeah. 2020 should be higher than the 0 0.4 they're projecting now. I'm, I'm leaning towards 0 0.6%. 0.6%. Correct. Yeah, so in terms of growth expectations, we're in that in that same sort of range around point below seven, one percent, below one percent, and so on. And importantly, this is obviously before any impact of the coronavirus is factored in as well. So we don't know what's going to happen there. Absolutely. Um, so that, that's a big risk to to growth, um, not only for South Africa but globally, of course. Um, yeah, in, in terms of what the deficit is, we'll be looking at next year. Uh, Quickly, I think it's going to be in the low fives. The low fives, and uh, March twenty seven. Moody's? Uh, Moody's, uh, no, I think we'll be all right, at least for, for the next nine months or so, for six months. Thank you to Annabel, thank you. Tendani, thank you. And thank you to Kyle from our PW Attacks. Before we go, a quick look at where the rand is, and then we'll talk about it, of course, on the other side. 1525, we're recorded, done, dusted. Thank you very much indeed for watching uh, this uh, preview of uh, the budget. See you on the other side.